and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother here in the temple. And the creator, uh, the creator of Aether and Steamworks, which is which is currently kickstarting its expanded material. He is not a tie dye, but he is Tyson Burrus. I'm hoping I, I'm hoping I remembered how to pronounce it correctly. That's how correct, you doing yeah. tonight, man? <laughs> I'm doing great. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, last time was a blast, and I'm sure this time will be no different. Mm -hmm. um, of course. Uh, of course, al alcohol is not al alcohol is mandatory for me, but optional for everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So last time I had you on here, we had we had delved into the 1.5 edition of um, Aether and Steamworks. Which congratulations on getting that out there. Excellent, thank you. Oh. It was a uh, it was a long process. Yeah, and equal as much congratulations for acknowledge acknowledging one important thing that some people um. Some people forget to put in their PDFs, which which should be mandatory in my opinion, and that What's is that? bookmarks. Ah, uh, yes. Bookmarks are uh, very important, especially when you have you know a four hundred page book. Mm -hmm. the, the two th the two th the two hills I will die on is in, any book of a sufficient size should have should have bookmarks and or an index. Absolutely. Oh. Uh. Or, or, or in some cases, a, ta a table of contents that's not filled with lies. Looking at you, Palladium. <laughs> I tried to make my my table of contents as accurate as possible. I've also tried to find ways in the uh, some of the earlier editions when I was still doing it. I took the the table of contents and made links to every one of the things in it in your PDF, so you could just click on it from there and go to the page. Yeah, but uh, it proved problematic uh, because it wasn't always linking up right. Yeah, it's. Hyperlinks in PDFs is still is still a relatively new thing. I'd say the only person I know who who goes out of his way to do that consistently is is um is the is the guy be, is the uh, guy behind the Fragged games. Ah. Hmm. Um. He's also the only ex the only person I haven't roasted over an open flame about his lack of indexes because he puts bookmarks and hyperlinks in his uh, stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, you know. A little redundancy. You never hurt anybody. Yeah. So, in the you mentioned it, you mentioned the development of one point five being a link, being a lengthy process. What were, what would you say were some of the um, some of the lessons that you had learned in the in the process of getting that out there? Well, uh, the biggest steps in it are balancing. Um, in order to balance your game appropriately, if you're trying to make something that's a little crunchier than just like a rules light system. Uh, requires a lot of playtesting, and especially at various levels of different classes and ancestry combinations um, in various circumstances and using some of the augments and abilities you might have in your game, that kind of thing. Uh, and uh, when you playtest and you find those things out, then you have to go back and adjust and make sure that it, that it fits right. My 1.5 edition wasn't even the final form. <laughs> Um, I now have my final edition up on the, the website with updated art and uh, rebalanced, you know, various little things that were problematic. Um, added a, a few different ways for uh, the system just to work easier for GMs. Like mm -hmm. in the 1.5 edition, my stat blocks for NPCs for monsters and stuff in the back of the book could be a little daunting. Um, but now I actually have stat blocks specifically for certain enemies, and I have tags so that a GM can go, okay, well, I have a, I have a big monster, and I want it to have an exoskeleton. I want it to be really large, so it's a giant size. And I want it to have, you know, it, it's very fast at digging. So you go and you grab those tags, and you put it on it, and it says, this tag gives it this much armor, and this much health, and this much movement, and that kind of stuff. So you can just grab tags that describe your creatures and make them on the fly now. Um, in an easier form than before. Mm -hmm. So again, it just comes down to uh, polish. The, the long process is polished. I could have just thrown it out and said, here's my game, deal with it, deal with the nonsense and with the mess. But I wanted something that 
was going to stand the test of time. <laughs> so I put in like another year into making sure it was as perfect as I could get it. Mm -hmm. And I still missed tiny things, which I'm going to have an errata page for um, just a, a document PDF that says, OK, I meant this in this part in case you wondered, <laughs> like falling damage. Right now I have it set to percentages over distance as you fall down, but it was supposed to be uh, 1d6 plus 10 percent health for every uh, distance you fell. Uh, mm -hmm. Distance is just a range of measurement um, over a certain limit. So when you fall 20 feet or further, you start taking damage and it, it will kill you eventually. There's no way to really stop that because it's also part uh, percentage based. Um, unless you have, you know, special abilities or, or your GM allows you to do some sort of crazy nonsense. Uh, that didn't get updated in the final version of the book because I just happened to miss it. And then like the day after I got the print made, <laughs> it's like, oh, I see that problem. Ah, crud, I can't do it again now. So, mm -hmm. yeah. The process of getting it out into PDF, not so hard. I mean, I can update that without a problem. But uh, the updates in the errata are going to be for hard copies for anything that somebody in the future might find or ask questions about or that kind of thing that I can't just change on the fly. Because anytime you're going to go make a hard copy, especially through a publisher like uh, DriveThruRPG, which is mm -hmm. who I go through at the moment, although I'm searching around. So if any of you out there are publishers and are looking for a game that would like a new home, <laughs> just let me know. Um, Drive Through RPG has a uh, a three month waiting time on book orders right now. So when I ordered a proof to make sure that it was appropriate, that the lines and the margins were all fine, that the the images showed up because there were times when I got proofs from them where all of my images in the book were black, just mm -hmm. ink, nothing else. Um, you have to wait like three to four months just to determine if it's okay, and then get it. You know, if it's not, reorder it. Wait another three to four months and it's like, that's, that's hurting my business. That's something yeah. that I need to be able to get out into the hands of people. So um, that was part of the 1.5 process before that was tough, was getting those books to my backers on Kickstarter uh, in a reasonable time frame because of how long it took. I think it was two months or three months after the date that I had planned on sending them to people that they were getting them. Mm -hmm. um, although I got the PDFs out like a month early. So... It was there. wasn't my fault. It was COVID. I swear, everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was distribution chains and all that kind of stuff that we're still struggling with. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, that was that was the long part. Was just polish, polish, polish. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, up until up until this, there's while well, there's been a few well there's been a few um well there's been a few smaller smaller expansions and adventures that you've that you've been put that have been put out oh that have been put out over the over the however however time intervals you want to go with um yeah every few months this is this is the this is the fir this is a full on pure um expan expansion in the traditional sense and when i was when i was going through the skinny of it um one of the things that I ended up getting I ended up getting reminded of is say the advanced player's guide in um, Pathfinder or or th or th or thing or things like the I'd the we need the um put up put in a bu put in a bunch of stuff put in a bunch of stuff that we couldn't fit in the core book kind kind of attitude that you see that you see with that you see with some games but if was did it start out like that or what or was it a case where you had a where where you had a where you had a specific direction for this for this expanded book well the expansion i did have direction for where i wanted to go ultimately mm -hmm. i have a road plan for how i want the game to continue growing in general mm -hmm. terms um this one right here did tie up a couple of minor loose ends. Uh, the World of Sedna is being launched in this book. And when I, if you have the main book, you can mm -hmm. tell that each one of my worlds, I give all of the main capital cities, some of the smaller and more important cities that are in there. I describe them. I describe story and plot hooks for them so the GMs mm -hmm. can go in and just be like, okay, I want to have a game that plays in this area because this kind of story is the one I want to tell. Um, Sedna was a uh, Eternal Dragon backer reward. Uh, that came in to play within like the last uh, month <laughs> before the book was supposed to be sent out to people. Mm -hmm. So um, when I created it, I just mentioned that there was a ninth hidden world that existed inside of the universe and how and I had to find a way to make that fit. 
and do the artwork for the person that, that did the backing and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and since then have developed what that world is. It was a place that was trapped outside of time. There was this ancient war between multiple different factions of individuals. The ancient monarchy and the elves fought a different faction of elves. And their ultimate way of winning this war was trapping the world in this space between time. Uh, so now it's coming out of that. They found a way to escape, which is all, again, narrative that will be described in the book. Mm -hmm. um, and all of the people that live there, all the ancestry uh, individuals, the different types of elves, the different types of dwarves, halflings, that kind of thing, are now being reintroduced into the universe and of course since this is after a major event and after a, a, a world's war uh reintegration of a brand new society of individuals suddenly when a planet shows up is obviously going to be a, a thing <laughs> mm -hmm. but um there are a few things here that are pretty much nothing more than just additions uh onto the pre-existing game so the the game itself is finished um but could use some expanding on the lore on the locations, on some of the uh, important NPCs in the in the canon, if you will, if you will, mm. because my game is kind of tied into the story and narrative of the universe itself. Although it can be played in uh, pretty much any setting, it's more designed to be played within the setting and within itself. Um, mm. But there is there is some details in there, like uh, enemy types. I, I've added in this new. Uh, equivalents above nemesis nemesis are supposed to be like your bbeg the big bad guy that you deal mm -hmm. with nemesis are more like uh or, or tyrant is the one above nemesis and they're more like uh, the tarasque they're more like the ancient black dragon they're the really big threats that are probably only super high level or require like really meticulous planning or an entire campaign to try to figure out how to take down um, the, ki the kind the kind of, of the kind of thing that would be a final boss in an snk game yes <laughs> <laughs> uh, I figured I figured I'd get at least one video game j joke out of my system because with with bringing up terms like nemesis and tyrant, I'm like, I know what you've been, I know what you were playing when you were writing this. <laughs> hey, I like video games too. What can I say? Hey, I'm, um, I'm not a, I'm not a grog. I'm not gonna, I'm not going to I'm not gonna I'm not gonna slag you for the, for that. I try I try and I've I have advocated for I've advocated for the last twenty years that um. That people that people need to stop getting a stick up their ass about the about the idea of taking inspiration from video games because well anyone argue, arguing that you shouldn't doesn't know their history. Video totally. games and I tabletop mean, games have been joined at the hip for the longest time. Well, it all it is is storytelling, and everything about human history is a narrative oral tradition in one way or another, whether mm -hmm. you're writing it down or putting it into a game or putting it into a movie or we're putting it in a book mm -hmm. or saying it to your friends. All we're doing is telling these stories uh, to teach, to entertain, to, to learn things about ourselves and about others, um, to make sure that our histories aren't forgotten, all of those kinds of things. And we borrow from everything, mm -hmm. always. There's no way to get around doing that because the human mind absorbs information and then puts it all together. The, be the least we can hope for is that we're at least mildly original when we're writing something or creating something. So uh, borrowing elements from games, hey, if it's a really cool game, go for it. Find a way to manipulate that into a, a tabletop format, and I'm sure you'll make bank. I've already got ideas on how to make like League of Legends into a, t a tabletop game, but mm -hmm. uh, I have to figure out how to get the rights to that. First. <laughs> <laughs> well, barring barring that, you could you can always go you can always go with with um with the best kind of distinct legally distinct. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you just make it sort of like, uh, um, and uh, you keep it just far enough away that you don't get lawsuits. Yeah, um, especially 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 since the. The closest, the closest thing to, the closest thing to ta to tabletop League of Le to tabletop League of Legends has was one get was Lane, which used the Bolt engine, and mm -hmm. and beyond th beyond that, I think there there was the Clank board game, and that's as that's as close as anybody's gotten. And, and if you really want the game to be like League of Legends, the the main thing you have to tie down is. What does a skill shot look like in a TTRPG? <laughs> yeah, it's 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 one it's one of the 
to be honest, I did, I did, I did consider how I, how I'd handle it um, when I was run, when I was running um, fourth edition, i.e., the the edition I'm supposed to hate but don't because I'm not getting paid. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I, I decided, I decided that trying, to, trying to utilize um, maps, trying to utilize a, ma a map of say Summoner's Rift was going to be way too much of an ask. Yeah. Um, so I ended up creating. I ended up creating a bunch of hex zones to to kind of to kind of simulate the effect. I wasn't one hundred percent satisfied with how, with how it turned out, and unfortunately, that's the best I can say because I lost my notes. The I'd say I'd say the big I'd say the big problem is you're is you're gonna have to you're gonna have to find a way to handle the whole advancement thing. Yeah, how everybody levels up every <laughs> x amount of time very fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, buying items and things like yeah. that to try to give it that feel. I mean, there are some things that approach it. If you've ever played the card game, uh, Legends of Runeterra, mm -hmm. they do a pretty good um, job of making a game that feels like you're playing League with cards. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you could you just have to figure out a way to translate it. There's a way. There's a way to do everything. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what we're trying to do out here. We're trying to make games like I'm. I'm trying to make a game that feels like a mixture of Firefly and Final Fantasy. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> uh, I have to say that I I think the players that I've had play the game for quite some time seem to be enjoying it quite a bit. So mm -hmm. I think I'm doing something right. Now, w I'd say I'd say one of the one of the big one of the big cruxes and all, and also the reason why my my earlier comparison to the to the adva to the advanced player's guide from Pathfinder doesn't doesn't qu doesn't quite hold up is the f is the fact that would it be fair of me to say that a lot of a lot of the expansion hinges on the return of the world of Sedna um not exactly that's a section so uh, the expansion focuses on some disparate things mm -hmm. uh the return of the world of Sedna is bringing three ancestries and uh, a world map that people can play on but the remainder of the expansion is just increasing what's available in the world one part of it is uh inventions uh which inventions are they're like the level abilities for tinkers but are also things you can buy in the world and use yourself um i had had a, a whole section on inventions in my early, early, early edition that hadn't that ended up being cut for the 1.5 and beyond. Mm -hmm. uh, that now I have a, a way to implement returning them, and they're kind of like magical weapons and items that you might get in Pathfinder or D and D or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it gives you a host of other things that aren't just static modifications and augments on the pre-existing equipment that you make. Mm -hmm. uh, instead, giving you these. This is a, a fantastic uh, device that you can wind a key on its back and you can talk to it it's a bird and it'll fly off and it'll deliver messages to people over mm -hmm. long distance you know there's there's a bunch of various inventions that will be used in that and those are completely separate from sedna so not required uh, as part of that story element or what have you um the other thing is the the one shots that are in there so one of the hurdles to getting into a new game is having content that you have to go out and you have to create and you have to you know all that kind of stuff and I provided four one shots that tie into different parts of the universe um, that all tell stories related to the game or to any game mm -hmm. um, that can be played in my system. I mean, you could take them easily and go play them in a regular D20 system or somewhere else, maybe with a little, a little more finagling. Mm -hmm. But um, but they'll all be set up so that when you play them, you'll know how to play the game and you'll have a starting point to kick off a campaign or uh, because of the way my system works you can play them at any level uh, since enemies are are not static uh, every one of them can scale based on what your GM wants to do with you um, it does allow you to have uh, a lot of opportunities to just play any of these games if you're just feeling like you know what I I don't want to create a campaign right now let's let's run honeycomb sting let's let's have a heist game where mm -hmm. you know we run into this this uh nobleman who's looking to steal a gemstone of various wealth from somebody and you can either take that and play with pre-made characters or play with characters that you have that you want to continue on the story with that kind of thing then we've got um when the sky fell that's a story of 
uh, a location in the Undercity in Albion. Albion's like a massive city. Think from Final Fantasy VII Midgar, right? Um, it's got these multiple tiers uh, where the noble <laughs> folk live up in the sky and all of the commoners and less and worse uh, live down below them on these multi-tiered platforms. And uh, somebody discovers that a, uh, a water section in one of the larger controlling plates is damaged and is likely going to collapse. And then it's a race against time. You've got four hours to find a way to fix that. And then you start running up against competition that's wanting it to happen for some reason. So again, another another story there. 119 is a story about mm -hmm. uh, trying to reach um, an alarm system to tell a city that there's an attack coming underway from the Tyel, which are a, an a elven organization. So they could be anybody. They could be some sort of shady, you know, it could be Zentarum that are about to drop bombs on a city or something. Whatever you want to put them in. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to fight through basically a gauntlet trying to find your way to this bell tower and you have to bring this thing and alert people and maybe you all die, maybe you all don't, depending on how your game goes. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a host of different games that are all designed in there, as well as New Ancestries, which can be played without Sedna. They can absolutely be done that way. Um, they're implemented in a way that just allows them to pre-exist in the universe if desired. Um, some of them already are not designed to have come from Sedna, such as the mechs, kobolds, the, uh, the gray kobolds. So people liked kobolds a lot recently, so I made a bunch of them of different types that all have various crazy attitudes and behaviors. <laughs> and then uh, more goblins and uh, more dwarves and more elves and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think I think um, co kobolds have kobolds have certainly enjoyed a redeemed reputation over the years instead of just being um, glorified cannon fodder. Yeah, I, I always enjoyed uh, <laughs> playing kobolds. My, my wife has found that I have like a you know a few different types of kobold voices and things like that that I would use in the past. And always enjoyed those characters. And, and I don't know a single campaign out there that existed where somebody didn't have a goblin or a kobold that the entire party fell in love with and wanted to keep around, even if they were considered some sort of evil creature. So part of my game was uh, wiping away tropes. Every single ancestry that exists out there, whether you're an orc or a goblin or a human or a dwarf or whatever, is just a shade of gray. Um, mm -hmm. Your actions determine if you're a good or bad person. Of course, I'm still not going to like elves because they're elves. <laughs> well, to be fair, the elves in my game are uh, a little complex. They are immortal and uh, tend to make decisions long term that may not have the best interest uh, at heart of the individuals in this timeline or, you know, in this uh, generation uh, when they're making those decisions. So it could be, you know, like, it could be assholes. Excuse my language. <laughs> no, ne no need to ex no need to excuse your language around around here. We. <laughs> We have we have no filters. Oh, um, well, there you go. I I just pl I just play up the I just play up the whole thing because because in my early days I played I played dwarves infrequently and and sp and spent lengthy amounts of time taking um insulting the party's elf. <laughs> Who hasn't done that though? <laughs> Let's be fair. That is in the pro in the professional circuits we call this dwarven diplomacy. Dwarven diplomacy. Yep. Uh, but yeah, we're adding a new a new dwarf as well that uh, is more of the. It, you ever seen like the dwarves from World of Warcraft? The the race of them that were nearly uh, stone, like part elemental. Mm -hmm. That's the newer ones that are coming into this. They're uh, gemstone aligned. They happen to live underground and enjoy it quite a bit, but uh, for various different reasons. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the new ans the new ancestries, you've got you've got six that you're bringing in, and I'd li and I'd like to go over them and 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 um cover what they particularly bring to the table, especially since um ancestries um have a lot more mechanical importance than they mm -hmm. than they would in some other games that people might be more familiar with. Yeah, they have levels of their own, so mm -hmm. you can level those up as you as you increase yeah. and advance your character. So we'll start with the Imni Elves. The Imni Elves are uh, heart readers. 
heart and mind readers. So they, they can know the intentions of others uh, just by sensing it off of them. Mm-hmm. So when I'm creating a lot of uh, things in my game, I tend to focus on what aspect of magic, what aspect of the Aether are they most aligned with um, so I can determine what types of powers and abilities and features they might have and that kind of thing. And Imni mm-hmm. elves are uh, closely related to mind and, and body magics. Um, so a lot of what they can do is read a situation incredibly well. Um, you can walk into a scene where you have a bunch of individuals that are trying to sell you something or whatever, and your Imni elf will be like, that guy's going to betray us for some reason. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And so that creates a narrative uh, dissonance between you and your GM's plans sometimes. I get that. But if you can't roll with it, then, you know, are you a good GM after all? <laughs> um, so ne- next would be the mechs with a Z. Mechs. Yeah. The mechs kobolds are uh, basically like frog locks. They're, they're, they're froggy lizards. Um <laughs> They are uh, ever seeking the skies, and they really enjoy heights and distances. Um, they're creative, they're inventors, and they constantly are trying to find ways to to be like the other kobold brethren. Some of them can grow reptilian wings, like dragons or what you know, dragon blooded that kind mm-hmm. of thing. Um, and the mechs can't; they can never attain flight unless they make it happen with uh, with machines and with technology. But they are so enamored of the sky and of that kind of thing that uh, when airborne, they get a whole bunch of bonuses to the, the, the roles that they're making, to the features that they're doing. So you're going to see them be a lot more airborne and uh, inventive. They make great pilots mm-hmm. uh, for individuals that are going to be, you know, using an airship type game or boats or, you know, land speeder type whatever. Mm-hmm. But they're small. Unfortunately, most of the kobolds in the game are like three feet tall. So, uh, except for Lezrin, which are seven feet tall. I would call them short, but then again, most people are short compared to me. <laughs> um, How tall are you? I'm six six. Oh yeah, so call me short. I'm five eleven, so <laughs> I'm, I'm still short. Yeah. You? So next would be the Gwei kobolds. <laughs> The Gwei are uh, turtles. <laughs> Gwei is another word for turtle. Uh, they're they're a shelled kobold, so mm-hmm. they're um, able to have uh, much greater defenses than just about any other class out there, mm-hmm. any other ancestry out there, just by by virtue of what they are, other than the war machines. Mm-hmm. Um, but they have a really hard time with equipment, so they're pretty much naked. Although you know you could probably find some clothes that'll fit. Something stretchy, whatever. Um, but the the fact that they have this shell as they've grown up means that they have a lot of skills that some of the others might not. Uh, mm-hmm. For one, they're not afraid of anything. Um, they're also uh, seeking adventure and trying to travel anywhere they can. Their shells are adequate slides. They can use those to go down any kind of slippery surface really fast, as well as being able to pull themselves inside of it at any point in time and protect themselves from attacks. So reflexively, they can draw into the shell and just start taking damage. But they take too much, the shell cracks, and it no longer provides them defensive bonuses, and now they're in trouble. Yeah, so t- so um, tank all you like, but don't, t- but don't over-tank. Yes, if you overtank, you are then out of defenses, and since armor doesn't work for you, that's all you got. You've got, you've got your shell, and you'll have to have it healed or repaired later in order to, to get back into yourself. So um, they're one of the only uh, ancestries that has continual damage reduction, and that can be improved as they level up. So they can get really tanky, but they are a bit slower than a lot of the other ancestries as well. They have short, stubby legs. They only have four move instead of your average five or six which is, you know, 20 feet movement uh, for mm-hmm. every action you're using. Very, very slow by comparison to some of the others out there, unless they're swimming. Mm-hmm. When they're swimming, they're fast. Now, next would be the pincher goblins. <laughs> pincher goblins are uh, acrobats, jugglers, manipulators, and thieves. Um, so their biggest claim to fame is that they're a goblin that that enjoys uh, taking things from others and parkour, an extremely high rate of movement and travel. They want to be jumping, flinging themselves into danger. Anytime that they're in a situation where 
they're doing something dangerous uh, because of their own actions and, and movement, they get bonuses. So they're more likely to, to succeed, but if they fail, they're in a really bad position. Mm -hmm. They and don't suffer from the inability to lie that Bajis do, so and uh, they're able to control their emotions a little bit better. Um, next would be the Maligned Halflings. Maligned Halflings... <laughs> They're also called the Zari. Um, they are borrowed, sort of. <laughs> I have to admit to that. Um, the Zari halflings and the Lion halflings are kind of like uh, Kender from Dragonlance, if you've mm -hmm. ever read that series or whatever. Oh, yeah. So they are a, a group of halflings that kind of got stranded on Sedna a long time ago and uh, ended up having to build together as an incredibly community focused. Uh, which led to this idea that family and friends support each other no matter what. That also means that everything my family and friends owns, I own because I might need it too. Um, so if you happen to, to have a Zari halfling or a maligned halfling, we call them maligned because they're, you know, some people don't fit them into society well. Mm -hmm. um, you go into a shop, the shopkeeper, and you get strike up a conversation. You get all buddy buddy. And you're like, "Hey, man, you're you're a great guy. I, I think you should be one of my friends." He's like, "Yeah." And then you just walk out with all of his stuff because <laughs> that's what friends do. I'm gonna need this later. <laughs> I need this grappling hook and that 60 feet of rope because I'm about to go climb a mountain. Uh, <laughs> um, so one of the benefits that they have is is that they have a pack where they collect various things in on occasion. And uh, if you are in a circumstance where maybe you need something. Uh, you can reach into your pack and possibly have it. I have a, a, a quirk that already does that, but mm -hmm. these individuals don't have the negative aspects of that quirk. They actually have some benefits for it. Mm -hmm. And if they get the quirk pack, pack rat that does the same thing, it expands on uh, how likely you are to succeed when you're reaching into your bag just to find an item. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, they're uh, communal-focused, possible thieves with lots and lots of stuff and sometimes random items that they can just have uh, if they were possibly around them at any point in time. Mm -hmm. Now, the next, the um, last one would be the Rodo Dwarves, which you, you, kind of are, you kind of already hinted that they, le that they lean a little bit more towards the stone, they're more stony than even normal dwarves. Mm-hmm. They are so much so that they could basically be made of stone or gem. Um, they decorate themselves with beautiful gemstones and whatnot. Uh, they can literally carve out stone and clay like, like it was clay with their hands, so digging is not a problem for them. Um, they happen to see perfectly in pitch blackness, so you know, dark vision, that kind of thing, which I only have on, I think, three ancestries in my game. So uh, as opposed to like D&D, Almost everybody except for humans can see in the dark. Mm -hmm. Not so much with my game. Um, it's it's more of a never kind of thing. Um, so that does give them an advantage in the underground type situations. They they feel uh, kind of that tropey. This is a type of dwarf that going above ground makes them feel vertigo because mm -hmm. they don't they see the sky above them. They don't like traveling on airships. They don't. You know, they have problems with uh, large communal gatherings of strangers, but um, when around their people, they're stalwart, strong. Uh, but yeah, their claim to fame is is uh, stone carving, stone manipulation, some of the weapons and magic items they can craft mm -hmm. out of it, that kind of thing. Oh yeah. Now, when it comes now, when it comes to the when it comes to each of them, um. Pr I'm pretty sure that much much like with the core ones, each each of them has their each of them has their own degrees of um, variance when it comes to how they when it comes to how they level up. Not mm -hmm. in not in terms of experience, but just in terms of making just in terms of it not being a linear path. Yeah. Um that that brings me to the classes, which you're you're going to be you're gonna be introducing five of them. And yes, I, I did uh, beta test two of them uh, out in the general public space, and then the rest of these have all been done in, in personal space or uh, on my live streams. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll, I'll start with the um, Ekata. Mm -hmm. 
So what what can you tell me about the about the Akata and what and what in particular is going to be bringing compared to compared to other, compared to other classes especially, especially in their case other magic cast classes. Yes. Uh, so the Akata, as you stated, is is more of a magic class. Uh, when it comes to this type of being, there is another class that I have in the game called Gifted. They're individuals who happen to have some sort of powerful patron that watches over them and feeds them power, inevitably trying to make themselves stronger so they can take over the body of the host. And there's this whole battle aspect for the gifted. Um, the Akata are kind of the opposite of that. They are individuals who know how to manipulate Eternals. Um, typically, they're individuals who have been through some sort of mental or physical trauma that has led them to manifesting aspects of their own personality as allies. Um, we had one Ikata that played that had uh, chains up both of his wrists, and one of them uh, was like emblazoned in flowers and mm -hmm. had this caring and loving aspected uh, being that he had tethered to that. And the other one was this chain covered in thorns and, and that showed like bleeding tattoo wounds on his arm that was uh, his aggressive side that would come out and lash out and injure people. So in the case of the Ikata, you have these two sides to yourself, and you can manifest them however you would like to describe it. Um, sometimes physically, like uh, there's a character named Nova in one of the games we're playing who has this little reptilian creature uh, called Stella and Cosmo, her other uh, pet, which is this massive lion wolf beast thing. Um, so the aggressive and the non-aggressive sides. Mm -hmm. And as you level up as an Akata, you kind of determine where how much power you're going to have in one of these kind of three or four spheres. Uh, one of which is making your adherent, your, your soft and caring and casual side, the one that can heal others, that can do things like assist you or allies, can bring things places, can teleport you uh, through little tiny uh, wormholes, basically, into the eternal realm and out. So you can choose to make that one more powerful as you level up, or you're chained, this aggressive, brutish, uh, sometimes exploding thing that ties people down and chews them, chews them to pieces. Uh, make that one stronger, manifest it into a physical form, and have, cause it to wreak havoc on a on a battlefield. Mm -hmm. um, you can uh, increase the strength of your ability to control Eternals, which are kind of like in other games, they're like uh, elementals or gods or devils or whatever. You know, they're a little bit of all of that. Um, mm -hmm. Allows you to tell them to do things and charm them and force them into actions and and that kind of stuff. Uh, allows you to control your environment a little bit more. And some of these types that might be enemies or might be big, important events, you can have some sort of sway over. And then the final bit is manipulating your ability to interact with the general world using mm. your magic. So part of that is uh, being able to talk to animals and plants and convince them to behave in the way you want them to and to do things like a druid might do. Being able mm. to entangle things with roots or draw trees from the ground or whatever. Mm. So... It's, it's a spread out class, um, like all of mine are. Pretty much <laughs> in my game, if you have a specific idea for the way you want your character to go, I've tried to manipulate the system in a way that allows you to do that and still have fun and have cool abilities that are strong. So you can have you know supporting types or <clears throat> uh, combat or tanky types or whatever. In the mm -hmm. case of this one, it really focuses and hinges on your ability to manipulate these, these aspects of yourself. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> is it is it a case where focusing on one aspect would would diminish the other and you have to keep them balanced or is that not the case uh, it wouldn't it would diminish ultimately what you were capable of uh towards the end so if you focused entirely on your chain you'd have a whole bunch of damaging and powerful effects and, and things like that but you would be missing out on a lot of your utility a lot of your ability to heal and assist your allies, the ability to uh, interact with the environment in ways that maybe you... so it does it does lead to how do you want to build yourself, um, which means multiple playthroughs is fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's one of my my biggest gripes with a lot of TTRPGs is that once you've played them and like one or two or three times, you and you've gone through you know five, ten levels, fifteen levels if you decide to get that far or even go to end game. The next playthrough feels exactly the same if you play the same character or mm -hmm. same class. And um, my game's not, not like that. If you want to play a million one-shots, you will always feel like you have something different you can do. If you want to play you know, long-form campaigns, 
and you do those back to back to back, if you really like a certain class and a certain ancestry, you can still play those and still have surprising things happen and still play differently. Mm -hmm. But but yes, you could handicap one aspect of yourself by focusing way too heavily on another. Yeah. Um, next would be the bulwark, which just from the name alone, it it I get the vibe of it of it being a very tanky boy. But I'm cu but I'm curious how it differentiates from some of the other tanky boys. So <laughs> the bulwark has gotten the nickname uh, the dad class. <laughs> Well, th well, the um, artwork doesn't exactly help that. <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, it's it's not obviously it's not gender specific or anything like that. But um, it does have a, a bunch of dad jokes in the ability list. <laughs> so, so in other words, you can't. Joke. In other words, you can't get mad at it being called the dad class because you kind of yeah, set it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I leaned into it a little bit, just a little bit, uh, when it was starting to get that way. But the idea behind the bulwark is. They are these overprotective individuals. And I mean overprotective, literally. They have one aspect of them that as you level up with them, they gain um, these selfless paranoias, is what they're called. Um, mm -hmm. Meaning that uh, you get you roll on a table and it says, okay, your character has problems when your party members run around with scissors. When they have sharp objects in their hand and they're not being safe, you have to kind of role play that off and be like, hey, hey, watch it. Care to, careful now. That kind of thing. Is this the so dad it's... class or the den mother class? <laughs> Same difference. Uh, but the, the actual class itself is based around uh, being able to take on those types of physical and mental harms that other people might have. Mm -hmm. So uh, for, forcing enemies to focus on you. So it is literally a class that has some taunt mechanics, which you don't get in a lot of other TTRPGs. Um, it allows you to do the the typical like warlord or battle lord style controlling of a battlefield. You can move mm -hmm. and impart yourself in places. You can give your allies cover. You can take damage for them. Um, as you become injured as the mm -hmm. bulwark, you gain strength. Uh, so there are various other classes out there. The way the game works is if you start taking wounds, you gain minus one to all your rolls for every mm -hmm. wound you have up until you reach six, in which case you're dying and you have to get some immediate help. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the Bulwark, instead of taking negative one to rolls, he gains plus one to rolls for every two for every two uh, wounds taken. So as you're in combat, it kind of incentivizes you to stay up in front of everything. And that's kind of the way the whole class is designed. It incentivizes you to take the harm that others would take, not just physically, also socially. So you can take on you know, uh, the blame game, as it were. So if you're in a social situation and somebody says something horrendous to another NPC and gets caught and there's going to be this whole scene, there are abilities that allow you to intercede and then take the punishment that would have happened to your ally. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the basis for most of the class. And, and it's, it's really designed around controlling uh, the field of uh, physical or social combat that is occurring. Mm-hmm. Although when when you mentioned when you mentioned it being able to um, get boosts from t from taking wounds instead of penalties, the gag that immediately comes to mind is is <laughs> is the one is the one HP gag with the with the with the Black Knight, because you know tis but a scratch. <laughs> yeah, a yeah tis scratch. just a flesh wound. A scratch your arms off. <laughs> There's a Black Knight joke in there too. Mm -hmm. So you hit that on the head. Yeah. Um, eventually, and this is this is again long term thinking, but I'm going to be creating alternatives uh, to each one of my classes at some point in the future, where under certain circumstances, a one of these classes turns into a one of these other classes because I don't currently have any sort of um, uh, multi class uh, style, you know, mechanics in place mm -hmm. for my game. If you want to play a class that's multi-class, you play a jack, because they can get a little bit of everything. Um, but there's a reason for that, because it's hard to balance one, and because two, narratively, you already get a lot of abilities in each one of your classes. But if something happens in your class, you will be able to switch at that point to an alternate. And an alternate for the Bulwark is the Berserker. So instead of being protective, now you're highly aggressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so... You know, there's there's some of those kinds of things. Like gifted will become void heart, so their their eternal is destroyed, and then they they will suddenly gain powers from beyond death instead of from this entity because mm -hmm. that entity was tethered to them and then was destroyed. So, 
that's the, that's that's down the pipeline though. The only so thing I ask when you do when you do that is make is make sure you don't run into the same paladin, don't run into the same issue that paladins have. Hmm. Um, which issue? There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, paladins are a bit of a problem class, but the the issue the issue that I'm referring to is the is the is the whole you ha you have to you have to act, you have to act within your within this specific definition of your alignments according to the GM otherwise no, you I become a that. black guard. It there's no <laughs> there's no alignment in my system. And that's there's specifically a reason for that. Because alignment doesn't fit anything in the known universe and is nothing more than a mechanic for a different mm -hmm. game. Um, so I've al I've always I've always held the idea that um when alignment was essentially how what what sort of pantheons like or hate you, it's perfectly mm -hmm. fine. But when they when it became a morality question, is when you start to have problems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now for for me, there's a lot of morality notwithstanding. There is no way to truly fundamentally measure that because anything you do could be considered good or bad depending on the context. Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to a pantheon that doesn't agree with you they don't need to do it by some arbitrary boxed in measure in my game if you have an eternal that's interested in assisting you with something say some very powerful entity right mm -hmm. if you're aligned in their goals and they trust you enough they will work with you because that's how that works and if you ever break their trust they won't it doesn't have anything to do with uh, oh you can always gain powers from xyz deity because they're so busy somewhere else that they're not Everything in my game is far more personal than that. Yeah. Uh, it's 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 easy it's easy to it it's easy to um to take to take shots at um at some of the traditions in the in the quote unquote world's greatest role playing game. According, of course, according I mean to... it's been around so long and has been played so much by all of us at various times in our lives that we yeah. know it so well that you can see all the fractures and the holes and the cracks in it. Oh, it's it's. I'd say I'd say the I'd say the the at, the attitude that I've always had is 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 for the longest time I've I've seen people talk I'd I would see people talk about how 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 great the greatness of the game or or the or more recently the ease of access of the game with nothing to really counter that argument. Well, if somebody if nobody's going to play the villain, I may as well I may as well do it. <laughs> do it. Preach. Uh, but the ne the next class that I have on that I have on the list, whose design whose design alone makes me feel like I'm being called out, is the still mind. <laughs> oh, you like the the samurai ninja idea? Um, I'm the I've always but I've always been. I will ad I will admit I have a um I have a love hate attitude with how with how, with the perception of say the say the Jedi, in the in the yeah. sense that. For for a for an archetype that's supposed to be based on samurai, they have more in, they have more in common with with wuxia than with than with samurai. Yeah. Um, and the f the but the but the the idea the idea of the idea of the of the, tra of the traveling swordsman or or the or the like who at who answers to his own particular calling. And it doesn't mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be um doesn't have to be samurai or ninja. It can just as easily be a wandering a wandering religious figure a la Solomon Kane or yeah. um or 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 even 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 somebody like the man with no name from the dollars trilogy you know yeah, some absolutely. somebody somebody who goes from place to place um aven avenging wrongs and and answering to answering to no one but their but their own code of ethics right absolutely um so when it so, so when it comes to the still mind, I can't. At least with the art that you have here, I kind I kind of see that vibe. That's truly what the vibe is. So the still mind method was invented on Sedna originally, mm -hmm. um, because the world is in flux in the time that it existed before the expansion. Because mm -hmm. it's far too complicated to play this in a game uh, for most people, where time is not linear. Um, so one moment you're having breakfast at the table, the next moment you're you're fighting somebody at the end of the world, and the next moment you're you know saying hello to your wife as a child, and the next moment you're that's the way that Sedna worked before the expansion happened. Mm -hmm. Meaning that individuals who live there 
had to develop techniques to keep from going insane. And the still mind method is what, uh, what came out of that. Some individuals had escaped Sedna uh, through various situations in the past. They mm -hmm. spread around this, this uh, method and this behavior, and it created this, this entire group of individuals who have learned this and studied it continuously and meticulously and trained it and spread it around throughout the Aether Sphere. So it is mm -hmm. separate from Sedna um, at this point, but it is something that, that originated there. So the idea behind the still mind is you have a class of individuals who uh, have a code of ethics that are developed as you level up. Um, so I like I won't stab somebody in the back. I'll always offer food to, to people in need. I'll provide shelter when I have it to those that also want that. Mm -hmm. You know, I won't trample plants. <laughs> There's a bunch of different codes that you get uh, depending on what abilities you choose as you level up that are directly related to what those abilities do. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so by the time that you, you've reached the end game, your character is very well defined in who they are, what they will, what they will not do. And if you break any of those tenets, you have severe penalties that are associated with that temporarily. Your character goes into a, you know, a, a, a crisis moment with themselves because they've broken their own tenets and mm -hmm. it becomes problematic. And each one of them uh, has sworn off using firearms instead, choosing to re only use honorable types of weapons and whatnot, mm -hmm. uh, such as uh, blades and bows. And um, they really do kind of focus on uh, a few different varieties that are kind of related to the way that samurai kind of did things. It was inspired um, mm -hmm. by the samurai, but not necessarily pulled from there. Part of that is uh, social acumen and the ability to uh, stop a negative encounter or engagement. So uh, they get very good at, um, you know, talking to people. And uh, uh, what is that called? Why can't I think of it right now? Because I'm tired. That's why. You know, when in politics, people uh, all address each other around a table and then they talk about stuff, parlaying. <laughs> Yeah, anyway. we can, yeah we can go with that. We'll go with that. They, they're good at parlaying with people in a way to create uh, mutual decision making <laughs> that mm -hmm. de-escalates situations. Um, they can be very capable at uh, being aware of their surroundings, what's going on, in tune with the the environment, being able to see threats and react to them faster than others. They can become uh, exceptional swordsmen mm -hmm. or weapons masters. They can become incredible rangers uh, or, or like ranged fighters. Um, so they they basically develop, like I said, these these tenants, and then you pick and choose how strong you want them to become in various aspects of what those are. Until at the end, you're the wandering samurai. You're the wandering swordsman. You're the wandering individual who goes around and does these things because they believe in a certain way and they try to help others. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the other aspects of it is the still mind is incredibly capable of avoiding mental influence and getting out of things like mind control, hallucinations, illusions, uh, berserk status effects, things like that. They're able to control themselves far better than others, but they also excel at taking their time. So one thing that is very important to them uh, and this is a uh, this is a trait that I haven't seen in a lot of other TTRBGs out there is when they decide to wait on their turn, when mm -hmm. they decide to wait until they see what the enemies have done, what their allies have done, and then choose to react, they get the biggest amount of bonuses. So they take very measured, meticulous approaches to things. So it's, it's a class that really um, gives you a whole bunch of benefits from taking your time. Mm -hmm. Oh, could you wait? Could you wait one moment? I need. I need to pause. Mm -hmm. So next on the list, I have the scoundrel, which <laughs> a lot of people hear. A lot of people see that name and they're and they're think. Typically, they're thinking of the. Ro of the roguish archetype, um, or as I've nicknamed the Han Solo class, mm -hmm. um, how sim how similar or diff or different would the scoundrel be in the in that archetype, and where would it differ from similar rogue like archetypes? Especially so it good. It is inspired by by the ha the Han Solo style uh, archetype. We'll say mm -hmm. um, they're individuals who 
really dwell in being able to get in and get out of circumstances. Um, so one of the draws to them is that in my game we have uh, what are called reflexive actions. Those are actions you can choose to take on any turn. Yours, your enemies, your allies, and that gives you an element of strategy, uh, especially with your, you know, working in tandem with your allies that can get you through a lot of problems. The scoundrel in this game, every one of their abilities is, is reflexive. So uh, they're the only class that is like that. And it really gives you a toolkit that allows you to say, well, I'm going to do this on this turn. I'm going to do this on this turn. You save your points, you save your overload to do that kind of thing. Um, most of their abilities are based around being able to talk people into things or being able to make yourself not known or not noticed or taking advantage of uh, when an opponent is distracted or has some other types of uh, disadvantages that you can you can work out. So. Uh, similar to way, the way a rogue does, where you can get a bonus uh, X amount of damage, you know, when you get a, a sneak attack on somebody. The uh, scoundrel gains the ability to do extra damage, to get better rolls, to enhance what they're doing when their opponent is under the effects of being distracted or surrounded by multiple uh, allies that are working against that individual, or for a host of other reasons, some abilities that can just give you, um, give you that feature on them uh, whenever you want basically if you if you can set it up right so uh they're they're again just a slippery eel <laughs> type class um and they can get attacked and if if they haven't been attacked recently they can just nope out of the way and kind of slink aside and try to hide and try to come back out and fight again and uh try to convince others not to fight them to begin with mm-hmm. uh, they gain reputation based on completing uh individual subquests as they play so at certain levels it'll be like well as soon as you've sold an item that you didn't previously own for a hundred silver you will gain one point of reputation (laughs) and uh, at another one it's as soon as you've completed three jobs that do this this or this then you gain a reputation and the higher your reputation the more features that you get for some of your abilities as you play in the game so it incentivizes you to really look at those and say how in this circumstance we're inside of a kingdom that likes us, but mm. I have to do some shady stuff <laughs> in order to get my bonus. How do I accomplish that in a way where we don't all get caught? Um, so really, it really uh, teaches your players to think a little bit outside the box and to find ways to manipulate the uh, legal sphere uh, mm-hmm. whenever they want to. Well, um, when it comes... Well, if the, I suppose I suppose an easy an easy way to work an easy way to work with that is um is the is the Corsair method. Yeah. You know, the whole, the whole thing of so um as long as long as you as long as you are lo- as long as you are looting and pillaging those guys' ships, we're gonna look the other way. <laughs> yep. It's gotta set it up right. You just gotta know what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Like as long. If you if you pillage our, if you steal our shit, then then you're gonna then you're gonna deal with the law. But if you pillage their shit, no, we don't care. <laughs> yeah, buc- buccaneers versus pirates. I mean, mm-hmm. the same thing. Yeah. Um. Now, last but certainly not least, since since you brought you brought up, I find it funny that you brought up Final Fantasy er- earlier as one of your inspirations, given that that given that that particular series has had its fair share of um, gag builds over the mm-hmm. years. And I definitely get that energy with the Brewster class. <laughs> it feel it feels like it feels like what would happen if um if so, if somebody with a very twisted sense of humor decided to make an alchemist class. Yeah, that's exactly what that was. Uh, so the Brewster comes with a disclaimer in front of it, stating that if you are wanting to play this class or have it in your games, be prepared to be derailed as a GM, <laughs> um, because the Brewster has a uh, hundred. Uh, a table of 100 uh, side effects that occur pretty much whenever they use their abilities. So they they create potions on the fly. They're Mm -hmm. called brews. And uh, they can have a variety of effects from healing people to injuring enemies to creating sticky glue-like traps to uh, growing a third arm out of your chest with a bunch of barbs on it that'll strike at your enemies to swallowing something that then flings you across the room. Uh, there's a variety of different, uh, very strange and exotic brews involved in this game that you can also in- increase in strength. So that one of the, the beginning uh, <laughs> abilities is 
that you can choose to find uh, unique ingredients. You have to describe to your GM what they are out of the area that you're in only a couple of times an episode. And uh, those ingredients can be used to enhance and make your potions stronger. So the weirder and the gr grosser and the stranger that they are, the more points you get, especially mm -hmm. as you're trying to force your allies to choke down, you know, rot gut <laughs> that uh, you made for them out of the, the local bugs you just destroyed. Yeah. Um, anyway, so every single one of these things has a side effect. And the side effects can be pretty impactful sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, they can be very tiny and, and uh, benign. They can be things like, oh, your, your character now only uh, becomes intoxicated when they smell flowers. And that's for X amount of time. Most of these things only last for the scene that you're in, but some of them have a little more lingering effects. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, could, I could give you an example of one if you'd like. Yeah, go, yeah, go ahead, because I, I think it I think it would be key to demonstrating how derail-y um, how derail they can be. All right, all right. So give me a number between 1 and 100. I'll tell you what's on it. Um, 57. 57, he says. Uh, 57. A strange sensation overcomes the user as their skin melts into a puddle of wax. Due to exposed sensitive areas and nerve endings, all damage is doubled against them and they gain plus two distractions. The user gains plus three regen applications when this effect expires. So they take more damage and uh, they have a harder time rolling. Now, if you gave this to an enemy, you'd be like, yeah, that's great. Uh, they heal at the end of it when it uh, expires. But, you know, if, if uh, it doesn't expire before you're done with them, then that could be a problem if you gave your ally something to buff up their strength. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, I bring I bring up the I bring when it comes to the when it comes to the alchemist, I bring I bring that up because um there's there's always been three angles that that say pathfinder style alchemists could do and i'm not trying to compare mm -hmm. one or the other i'm just uh, i'm just bringing it up because because of potential for chaos um potions and the like is one angle the other angle is explosions and the third angle yep. is um mutagens i think when it comes to the yep. first and third you have that covered but would but would a would a Brewster be able to make a be able to make a form of rat rot gut that might uh, that might give somebody heartburn? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there's there's a variety of things here that don't mm -hmm. do huge things as well, but will allow you to uh, to make some minor effects that you're looking for as well. So uh, there's a draught right here, where there's a brew called Peaceful Draught. You provide it to an uh, enemy or an ally. It calms them down. Mm -hmm. It removes some of the effects that are on them and uh, makes them pacifistic temporarily. So using it on an ally could get rid of special so effects in their brain or whatever that are happening, uh, but then they can't fight. Or you can use it on an enemy and force them to drink it, and then they can't fight you either. Um, but yeah, I, I do have explosive. I do have big stuff. I do have little stuff on here as well. Uh, some of the side effects, again, can be strange and can impact lots of individuals we had. Um, <laughs> so one of the first engagements our Brewster got into in the beta that I was playing, his name was Finn. He decided to drink a brew that made him stronger, which it did, but it caused his eyebrows to grow out over his eyes, giving him temporary blindness. So he got but couldn't see what he was going to hit. He decided to drink another drew, a brew just to enhance his ability to hit after that point, and then he grew tentacles out of his chest, which uh, proceeded to make him uh, have problems because he also grew, <laughs> as a side effect, tusks out of his mouth. So he ended up with these massive tusks, tentacles wa waving everywhere, huge overgrown eyebrows he couldn't see through, and then uh, his right hand fell off and became a dagger um, that his allies proceeded to use. So he just... They just made him hug their enemies, and just he ripped them apart at that point because he was so strong. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't see or do anything other than that. So they had to like direct this this character around and like push him into bad guys to take him yeah. out. Uh, why am I be why am I being reminded of the medic from Two Fort? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the whole thing of no, oh, don't be such a baby. Ribs grow back. No, they don't. I mean, if, if you're wanting to play more of a traditional alchemist or someone who has uh, powers of transmutation, permutation, that kind of thing, I've already got that as a class in the main game. Mm -hmm. And the potions they have are reliable and consistent, and they have years of training and education to make sure all these things work right. 
But if you want crazy, this class will give you crazy. <laughs> oh. Okay. Give, me, give me another give me another number. Between one and hundred. I'll read that one off to you. Alright. Let's go let's go a little bit higher up. Ninety nine problems. Ninety nine. <laughs> uh that's a simple one. The user forgets how to talk in anything more than slang and swear words. <laughs> So, that was fun. We had that happen on stream when we were playing this game, and one of our players who never swears suddenly had to make everything into slang and swear words. <laughs> so, in other words, just normal Scottish language. Yeah, there you go. I mean, that's that's not fair. You got to change it up somehow. If that's the case. Yeah, I know. I'm. Just, I I I just I just have to. I have to. I have to be me. <laughs> of, course, of course. Oh. I I could I could have gone. I could have gone with either that, or I could, or I could have gone with um, with um, well, with Welsh English. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but you can see. I mean, you can see how this could potentially derail something. Suppose yep. you were giving your face some uh, the ability to enhance their charisma, their their charming in this mm -hmm. game. Uh, they were about to talk to somebody very important. You gave it to them, and now all they can talk in is slang and swear words. So suddenly, that that derails what your plan was to begin with. Yeah, i I could see I could see one of my players u using this um, using this so solely solely to talk in their na in their native accent, um, and can and confuse everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> well, here, here I'll give you one more just to show how crazy it could be. All right. So this is if you roll an eighty-five. Mm -hmm. It says with a snap, a turkey neck and head grows out of the user's most useful kneecap. Turkey is surprised and proceeds to peck at the user's lower abdomen, causing bonus distractions. Turkey has ten hit points. You can be distracted with worms and bugs for a round. <laughs> as if it as if it isn't bad enough that I've got turkeys walking around the parking lot at my work. <laughs> yeah, you want them growing out of your kneecap, pecking at your stomach. Yeah. Um. Uh, but when now when it comes to the quick play setup that you have, um, mm -hmm. a lot of times when I see when I've seen quick plays or one shots in pl in plenty of games. They usually are at a set level or power tier. Yeah, but in your case, you're um, you're ha you're having it set up that they could be played at any level. Yeah, my system is uh, versatile in that way. So if you say you're going to have all level one characters, your enemies mm -hmm. are just tier or tuned to level one. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to have it at level one hundred, then your enemies are tuned to le well. I mean, level fourteen is max at the moment. Maybe that'll change someday, but right now I don't have any plans for that. Mm -hmm. Um then you can play it at that level because the enemies, the threats, and the targets, uh, role targets, which are like your DC uh, for various roles, are all based on how complicated it is for your character to achieve. Mm -hmm. um, so even if you're a legendary locksmith and you come up against uh, something that's supposedly housing the most, most uh, vibrant wealth in the entire Aether Sphere and is behind the biggest and most crazy locked door, your role would be the same, <laughs> and your role target would be mm -hmm. different based on how complicated that might be for your character by your GM. Yeah, um, it when now when it comes to the three quick plays that you do have, I'd like to, I'd like to go into them and kind of kind of get a, I guess a genre or tone feel for what you're going with, and I'll start with one one nine. Which mm -hmm. the way it the way it seems to be described of of going into this derelict ship, um, remind seems to remind me a lot of a lot of the derelict ship type of science fiction horror that we'd that we'd see in the eighties and some of the nineties. Obviously, the big example of this kind of thing would be Alien. Um, yeah. Other examples other examples might be well, it's not nineties, but Dead Space, um, Virus. That's a bit that's a bit of an mm -hmm. obscure one. Totally. Um, I, that's and um, that's hitting space the Hulk. nail on, like, absolutely hitting the nail on the head there. So it has a uh, kind of those vibes. Uh, Dead Space was a big, um, it was a big influence for uh, a type of enemy in in my game called the Athalium. They're like mm -hmm. a hive minded, uh, organic uh, virus basically that tries to absorb biological material, and that's its entire goal in life. But it's mm -hmm. It's weak to certain types of things like fire and, and uh, pressure, space magic. Um, mm -hmm. So 119 is you're a bunch of individuals on this outpost uh, for whatever reason. If you're going with the canon in in system reason, if you're playing the game, you're a bunch of uh, 
like we were saying B company earlier, talking about that type of thing. Uh, a bunch of B company type soldiers or individuals who work out of this facility or possibly one of the pirates that had attacked it recently that's in the brig. Um, and you're living your day-to-day -day life and everything's fine, although it's all rusty and screwed up and nothing works quite right and the food is horrible and everybody knows it, but they try to ignore that fact anyway. Um, and then uh, an unexpected delivery arrives and on its heels, a bunch of monsters show up. And then it's all about trying to find a way to either get rid of the monsters, uh, lock yourself into a secure enough location that the Empire can save you, or finding a way to escape. Um, and that's that's the whole goal. It's got a bit, a bit of a time limit on it. After a certain amount of time, if you haven't secured yourself, if you haven't escaped, you become overrun because the, the threat is pretty much uh, impossible to fully destroy. So the ne the next one would be Honeycomb Sting, and if and given the fact that I brought up mo I brought up movie references with um, one one nine um, with Honeycomb Sting, I'm think I'm thinking of the classic heist the classic heist classic heist or gentleman thief approach um, stuff like Lupin the Third, which um, earlier this month celebrated its fiftieth anniversary, or th or th or things like um, Ocean's Eleven. That would be in a. Uh a positive direction style world mm -hmm. where that kind of planned and meticulous uh, could come out of it. But as we all know, being GMs uh, and gamers in general, not many of us are actually, you know, world renowned heist planners. So, uh, or just, or just planners period. Exactly. So it tends to be a little more chaotic than that. And this, this, uh, this quick play is designed so that, you have some options that allow you to feel like you mm -hmm. are a incredible heist planner, even when things should be going tits up. So the first things first, every single player that goes in this, if you're just playing it as canon, if you're not making it part of another campaign, or even if you wanted to, I suppose, but if you're not making it part of another campaign, if you're making this as the quick play, there is a table at the beginning that you will roll at random and provide complications to each one of your players in secret. So when they're in the middle of this heist, certain things are going to happen and they'll have to deal with them. Like somebody has uh, an irritable bowel movement uh, at the wrong time and your GM just sets that up. Or somebody happens to have a vendetta against somebody at the party and can't just allow them to be, which might throw out the entire plan and make you all get caught and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so each one of you starts off with this complication that's in secret that will come up at some point. And each one of you starts off with a Joker card. So in my game, we have aces. Aces let you reroll any roll, including tables or damage or whatever. Mm -hmm. Joker card's new, but it's based on uh, pretty much any of my uh, quick plays or one shots in the future that have some sort of interesting mechanic. Joker cards will be used for those interesting mechanics, mm -hmm. which is what they're called. So in the case of these, each one of you has one of them. And they can be used in a variety of ways. One of which is if you get into a circumstance that goes sideways, you can use your Joker card to have a flashback style black and white or sepia montage of I knew this was going to happen, so I set this act in motion so that mm -hmm. I could overcome this thing. And it describes how you would have to describe as a player uh, with your GM how you suddenly have a tool that'll help you in some way, or you've set the scene up in some way that'll give you an advantage against mm -hmm. the, the circumstances coming up. It's like, oh, you're about to be spotted by the guards, but da -da 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 back in the past, you happen to have this one guard was a friend of yours that you had a drink with earlier in the evening, and then he got swapped out for something, you know, whatever it is you want to describe, mm -hmm. however you want to play that. That allows the players to do it. Another option for that is, you can burn a Joker card to explain how uh, you kept your allies from getting caught with you when you did get caught. Uh, so that uh, you, you get taken away, you're placed in a secure location at the event uh, to be processed later, and the heist can still potentially continue and your allies can maybe save you and pull you out of there and you can still be successful. Mm -hmm. um, all culminating in you know uh, th this large party event where you have to figure out how you're going to beat it. You have multiple goals that you're attempting to do in order to be successful at the heist. And if you you know accomplish more of them, then uh, by the time that the, the the grab the final the final uh, scene basically happens, uh, you're more likely to be successful. Mm -hmm. 
So uh, they're, they're, these goals are basically what drives how you're going to be playing the game as a group. It's like I'm gonna be on, I'm gonna be spotting, I'm gonna be looking for things around the house. I'm this other person's gonna be doing this, and this person's gonna be, you know, getting rid of security, and that person's gonna be over there uh, mucking, mucking with the the nobility inside the building so that nobody is more aware and we can discuss things amongst each other and know where anything is at any given moment, set up distractions, that kind of stuff. And there is some high profile targets in this location. The Viscount Preston Dumash mm -hmm. is a, a very important character, very powerful individual. If you're playing it in my system, um, he is somebody that works for the DAD or the Department of Aether Defense and is what's called the sniffer. Uh, the, mm -hmm. That's kind of the rude term for it, but basically they are seekers. They hunt out uh, magical users or dangerous individuals and make sure that they are not a threat anymore. Mm -hmm. um, very powerful, would be considered like if you're in D&D playing level one characters, he's like a level 10, so you don't want to deal with them. Um, mm -hmm. So it's important as part of this game to make sure that person never catches wind of what you're doing and distracting them and putting them off or you know spiking their drink or whatever it is that you choose to do is one of the goals. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the idea, and uh, there are multiple avenues of entrance and exit to the mansion. There's various uh, ways to succeed in the game, depending on where you're at and how you accomplish things. So that you should have about a four-hour play period. Mm -hmm. So the third one in the list is when the sky fell. Yes. When the Sky Fell is a tale of uh, political corruption, ultimately. I don't want to give away too much of it, mm -hmm. but I guess if people are listening and are interested in playing it, then fine. Whatever. <laughs> if any of, my, any of my crew is out there listening at the moment and is wanting to know what they're in for here when we run this game. Uh, so if you play it as meta... Um, one of the individuals in your group happens to be working in a, um, a hydroponics facility located on Sector 3. You know, it doesn't really matter where it's at, but it's, mm -hmm. it's basically in the Undercity. And as they are working there and, you know, talking to people and whatnot, they find a flaw in the support structure uh, that they happen to work out of. And upon looking at it further, it is damaged pretty severely, and your character is not a, you know exceptionally gifted individual determining the reasons why something like this would be a problem so they go to find help and that's in the other crewmates mm -hmm. and uh, upon arriving with the other crewmates and going back and checking this thing out they realize that it was sabotaged and uh, this entire section of the city is going to have the above city dropped on it mm -hmm. and you start uh, trying to figure out how to convince others to uh, come to the aid, how to fix this thing, how to fix it yourself, whatever it is that you need to do. You're looking for a way to keep the sky from falling. And uh, along the way, you start running into opposition through agents of various factions that basically they wanted it to happen because it was less expensive to drop this down and then to reestablish the city than it would be to keep it there in place and allow the things to degrade the way they have been. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a nobles game where they're trying to silence you and you're trying to find some way to save people's lives. Mm -hmm. Now, the last one the last one that I have on the, on the list is The Last Alarm. Mm -hmm. So The Last mm -hmm. Alarm is like saving Private Ryan. <laughs> if we're looking for <laughs> if you're looking for uh, you know, any kind of references for that. Mm -hmm. And if played as is, you're all agents that work in uh, the Peacekeepers. They're just the militant policing force of the Empire. Mm -hmm. um, and they are just having time off. They live in the middle of nowhere. The, the position that they're in hasn't been attacked in a long time. Um, the war has been over for a period of time. And, uh, you know, they're just kind of being lazy and hanging out and mm -hmm. having some drinks at the local establishment when an explosion goes off. And then another one does, and then another one does. And all of your players then jump up from the table after having established this little relationship with this tiny city they live in to go outside and realize that there is uh, something called a dark cloud ship. Mm -hmm. uh, the dark clouds were, that's the colloquial term. I'm sure there's more of a scientific one we could use at some point. But anyway, it is uh, a vessel that carries uh, necrotic bombs. So they basically just create waves of death that radiate the ground and leave it that way for generations. It's 
this mm-hmm. game's version of like nukes, little ones. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and this ship is losing parts of itself and has an entourage that is drawing it in because the emperor happens to be celebrating his nephew's uh, recent wedding and, in a city nearby, uh, not too far off Scamanch. And uh, there's hundreds of thousands of people in, in <laughs> procession, the emperor and a bunch of high profile targets. And the Tael, uh, the elven monarchy remnant who want to try to uh, destabilize the empire and kind of grow back into power and prominence, has found it to be a target. So your job is to be the ones that sound the alarm because nobody else has. They, you, they've gotten past everyone's defenses. They're only a short distance away from making it to the town. And if no alarm goes off, there won't be enough time to either shoot the target down or find some way to protect the people or evacuate. Mm-hmm. So, as you leave this bar and as you start trying to head back to the the, the bell tower, um, enemy elite forces all drop into the city, trying to silence everybody there and start mm-hmm. wiping them out. So you mm-hmm. have to deal with these clouds of this radiative material floating around. You have to wear safe tech because if your players get into it, it basically kills them, or it makes them die over a certain amount of scenes if they get just a minor whiff of it. Um, if you're playing this long term with uh, like a big campaign group or something like that, you can probably work around that in a different way. But but if you're playing it as intended, it's supposed to be this very uh, possibly emotional story about the bravery that these soldiers go through in just trying to save other people at all risk to themselves. Mm-hmm. Um, I've played this one. This is the one I've actually played the most with... Uh, other groups out there, the From Afar podcast, over on Dice Tyrants when it existed. Uh, it, shoot, what was the other one called? A shared Experience. Uh, played it with uh, them. Played it with a, a bunch of different streaming communities out there. And pretty much every time, it turned into uh, a very emotional period. And we've had like players who got really into their characters and then had to make these grand sacrifice type situations. And, I mean, it's it's an, it was an impressive and impactful thing. Now, what are you now? Um, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count for this thing? This one, well, the, my last book, I was shooting for three hundred and came out with four hundred and six or four hundred four hundred two. Excuse me, four hundred two. Uh, <laughs> this one should be around two hundred and fifty pages, somewhere mm-hmm. in between two hundred and three hundred. So um, it's going to have the, the whole ancestry section with some describing details uh, about each one of them and what they can be used for, that kind of thing. The classes, all of their level up information, because each one of them has 10 levels. So you'll have mm-hmm. 10 pages per class. Uh, actually, it might be might be between like 150 to 200, actually. So I'm thinking 200 is the, is the number. All right. Um, then I'm going to have multiple pages of uh, new enemies. Uh, we actually met a couple of our Kickstarter goals, which has added a few extra pages of enemies and inventions. Mm-hmm. Um, new equipment. I've got a whole section that is going to be written into it uh, called the Workshop, which is uh, more of a chop shop. <laughs> a character named Red Iron uh, happens to have a an augmentation shop that will have a whole bunch of new augments that are in that as well. So... Uh, if you have a character that wants to play more of a cyborgy type, they can do that. Um, and then, uh, like I said, the enemies, I'm going to have more factions, more information about NPCs, about types of enemies that would be in the game, things like the tyrants that be in there in their own like relatively large section. And the world, like I said already, I mm-hmm. think. Yeah, so that's that's basically it. I'm making sure that I have all the, and the obviously, the one-shots, the, the quick plays in mm-hmm. there, too. And I'll have description uh, hooks and things like that inside of uh, the game to describe how you can go, where you can go, and what you might want to do after various events in the game. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops. But with all that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come back to the temple and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah. It was fun. <clears throat> and... Anytime you, anytime you see you see fit to return to the temple, whether it's to discuss more of either in Steamworks or to, or or to do a glorified shit post, the door is always open. As <laughs> I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thank you. 
And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the Internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>